the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. Ransom me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child.
sing, how lovely is your dwelling place. How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, for my soul longs in even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied, for here my heart is satisfied. Within your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. All right, let's sing together. Better is one day. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. And thou little swear. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. A thousand elsewhere. A thousand elsewhere. All right, let this come from your heart. Let's say this as a prayer. One thing I ask and I will seek. One thing I ask. And I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place, to find you in the place your glory dwells. One thing I ask, one thing I ask, and I would seek. Your beauty find you in the place to find you in the place your glory dwells. All right, let this come from your heart. Better is one day. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts and down elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. My heart and my flesh cry out. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted in a scene. Come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you. And better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in courts, a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. And thousands elsewhere. And thousands elsewhere. Hi, welcome to Starkville First United Methodist Church. I'm Jim Genesee, the senior pastor here, and it's a joy to have you worshiping with us. We've got a change in plans today. We had planned to be live and in person here in the sanctuary, 
But our Bishop, James Swanson, in light of all the continuing changes surrounding the COVID-19 issues, has directed all the United Methodist Churches in Mississippi to discontinue on-site services until further notice. So we're coming to you digitally today. We're gonna to continue to be with you through our broadcast on WOBV TV, as well as our live stream platforms on YouTube and Facebook. We want you to stay connected spiritually, as well as stay safe. And we want you to take care of yourselves. So please follow us, but also watch after each other. We've got a special treat today for us. Dr. Giles Lindley will be bringing our message and we welcome Giles back to the pulpit here at this wonderful church. Now with all that, will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come to you today with many things on our hearts and our minds, but we come to you. You have made us, you have created us to be who we are in your image. And we who are your children praise you today. We ask that you would be with us because we know that often like children, we wander away. We turn into our own ideas, our own desires, and turn away from you. You continue to call us back. You receive us into your loving arms. And all you do is continue to be gracious to us. So we come to you today seeking your forgiveness, seeking your healing, and seeking your hope that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may be renewed and made once more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, until people no longer see us, but see Christ who lives in us. We thank you for this church, for the opportunity to worship, even through this amazing technology that we're able to share. And we also are thankful for the opportunity to serve one another, but also our community and our world through the ministries of our congregation. And we are appreciative, Lord, of the encouragement and the support we receive from one another by your Spirit. We ask today that you would be with those who are struggling with life. It may be a relationship issue, it may be financial, it may be decisions about what they do going ahead with so many uncertainties. Give them wisdom, grant them peace. For those who are dealing with illnesses, particularly those who are facing this uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19 virus, we ask that you would provide healing, healing of the body and healing of the soul in your way and in your time. And God, even in the midst of all these struggles, we know that some of us face the darkness of death through the loss of loved ones, either recently or in days gone by. We ask that you would give them hope and give them the light of eternity that comes from the light of the world, Jesus Christ. That they may know that life continues beyond this world into the next because of the resurrection power that he shares with us. Lord, we ask that you would be with us during this worship service. Speak through your servant Giles and let his words be your words to our hearts today. We lift all of these things to you, praying in the words and in the spirit that your son taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all so much. God bless.
Now we will say the call of worship together. Follow along on your screens. I do not turn away from your ordinance, Lord, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We will now recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he ascended at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I feel the touch of hands so kind and tender. They're leading me in paths that I must run. I have no fear when Jesus walks beside me. For I'm sure Good morning. Good to be with you. Our scripture today is from Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter. It's the parable of the sower. It's one of my favorite stories. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Well, it, it, is, it is good to be here today, even though it's not quite what I expected. I, I was hoping this would be a live service. I was hoping to have people out there to, to preach to. I was hoping to get to see some of y'all, because I haven't been out. I haven't been out for church in a while. So I was looking very forward for this to be my first time back in this pulpit in two years. Uh, first time to preach in several months anywhere. And I was hoping... I was just looking forward to seeing you again, but I guess that is not to be, but I'm still excited to be here bringing you this message today. We've been doing reasonably well. Lisa, of course, is doing much better than I am. Lisa is very happy with her cat, with her computer. She just stays at home. She gets to FaceTime with the grandchildren every day. She is doing fine. I, on the other hand, am going crazy. I have plenty to do but I miss the day-to-day -day interactions with people. It's, it's almost to the point where I would go to a trustees meeting just to get out and see some people. I'm not quite to that point yet, but that's where we are. But this was supposed to be my first Sunday to get out. We've been having a normal schedule on Sunday morning. We get up, we watch our son-in-law in North Carolina is a Methodist preacher as well, so we watch his service, and then Lisa will go to Sunday school online, and then we will sit down together and watch the 11 o'clock service over our TV station. That's become our Sunday morning ritual. And then we have pancakes. It's a, it's a pretty good deal. But I was looking forward to this. The other week, we were watching our son-in-law, and he made a good point in, in his service. He uh, mentioned the fact that prior to the recent unpleasantness, if you ask people to describe a peaceful setting, they probably would have described a, a, a quiet wood, a walk on the beach with not many other people around, that early morning coffee when nobody else is up. They probably would have described times and places where there were not a lot of other people around. That was what peaceful would have been for a lot of people. But I think, having tried out that sort of peace for several months now, I think most of us might change our mind and look for some other sort of peace. But here we are, and uh, I enjoy peace and quiet, but I, I enjoy being back in a sanctuary. I enjoy being in a crowded classroom. I enjoy being at a football game or a baseball game or a basketball game. I enjoy, I really do miss Wednesday night dinner at church. I think I've missed that as much as anything. And uh, I'm happy to be here today. I probably, it may be for the best. I might have gotten frustrated. I might have tried to hug somebody. I might have tried to, to shake somebody's hand. I mean, I was prepared for today. I had my mask ready. I had my, my, my six-foot distancing measure to make sure, well, I don't know how it would work. But I was ready to stay socially distanced. But here we are. And so we're going to share this message today. The scripture lesson is one of my favorite passages, and it's been a favorite since my MYF days. I remember seeing the movie Godspell when it first came out and seeing them act out the, the parable of the sower. And, it was, and we had lots of interpretations of that in our youth group. We loved to act it out ourselves. The, the, the parts of the weeds and the parts of the birds plucking the seed up, those were the most coveted parts in our youth group. But we knew that story very well. But at the same time, we probably didn't know it beyond a surface level. We probably did not know that story very deeply, but that puts us in good company because a lot of people had trouble understanding some of Jesus' parables, particularly the disciples. They did not always get what he said. As close as they were to Jesus, as much as they had spent time with him, they did not always understand what he was saying. And after this particular parable, they asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus senses what's going on. He realizes they're asking about parables, but they're really saying, boss, we didn't get this one. So he explains a little bit about parables, and then Jesus goes on to explain this parable and what the different parts need, mean. He tries to explain to them, what's being sown is not seed, but it's the word, his word, the gospel, his message, his message that's being proclaimed and sent out into the world. And the parable is about what happens to the seed, what happens to that message after it's been thrown out there. And Jesus says there are basically four responses. The first situation is when someone just doesn't listen, or maybe they hear, but they really don't understand. It's out there, but they don't pick up on it, and it doesn't do them any good. And that's the seed that falls on the path and gets eaten by the birds very quickly. This is one that most preachers, most teachers can relate to. There's sometimes we're just putting it out there and it just seems to fall flat and nobody is picking it up at all. The next two we're pretty familiar with as well. The seed that falls on rocky ground 
is seed that springs up quickly, but it has no roots. It starts off pretty well, but without roots, without a, a deep connection to the ground, it fails the first time there's trouble. And we get that. We've seen that. We all know people who got excited after a revival, excited after a retreat, but they never did anything with it. They didn't study their Bible. They didn't start going back to church more. They didn't do anything that would help them grow in their faith. So that when a problem did come along, as problems always do, their faith was tested and their faith was found wanting. They had nothing to fall back on except some fast fading good feelings because they had never done anything with that faith they had had. They had no foundation. They had no roots. Just some well-intentioned but pretty shallow religious feelings that were not up to the trials of the day. We've seen that happen. And similarly, the point behind the image of the weeds and thorns is something we've also seen. As Jesus tells them, the thorns are the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. In other words, the thorns, the weeds are distractions. Once again, we've seen that many times over. We've known people who started off with very sincere, very good intentions who let other people distract them along the way. And this time, it's not necessarily troubles. It's not even necessarily bad things. They meant to go back to church more. They meant to read their Bible more. They meant to get started going back to Sunday school. But something just got in the way. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was work. Maybe it was a family obligation. Maybe it was a ball game. Who knows? But something, one thing or another, got in the way of them starting that Bible study, getting back to church, going on that mission trip, doing any of those things that helps our faith to grow, helps our faith to mature, helps us to become the people that God knows that we can be. And faith that doesn't grow sometimes just gets crowded out. It just fades away. It's like a, a, a good plant that gets choked out by the weeds and the thorns. Methodists understand these two middle images, the rocky ground and the thorns, very well. Because while Methodists have always been evangelist, Methodists have always believed in preaching and teaching and revivals and camp meetings and saving souls, we always knew that getting saved is just the beginning. It's not the end. The fancy word for that is sanctification. And the way we understand is that, yes, you are born again. But you're born again as a baby Christian. Yes, you've been forgiven. Yes, your name is on the roll. But there's still so much you have to learn. There's still so much you have to grow into. And Methodists believe that we are saved not just to go to heaven, although that's a big part of it, but we are saved to spend the rest of our life here on earth following Christ and growing into His likeness. That's how we make our entire life matter. It's how we bring little bits of the kingdom of God to wherever we find ourselves. It's how we stand faithful, whether life throws us problems or life throws us distractions. This is something that, at least in terms of emphasis, does set Methodists apart from other traditions and other denominations. This is who we are as Methodists. This is who we've always been. In fact, while there are several roots of the, the Methodist movement that we know today, they're the Oxford Methodists, that college Bible study group with John and Charles Wesley and their friends. There were the lessons, good and bad, that John learned with his failed attempt at being a missionary to Georgia. There was that heartwarming experience that John Wesley had at Aldersgate. But I'm one of those people who believe that the real Methodist movement began in Bristol, England. When John Wesley got a letter from George Whitfield, who was the, the great revivalist, he was the great Billy Graham of that day, and he said, I'm having a wonderful revival here at Bristol, but I've got to move on. I've got to go to another town, and I need someone here to come and help these people, these, these new Christians, these newly awakened Christians. I need someone to come here and help organize them into classes and societies to grow and study and serve and hold each other accountable. And that is the point. That is the place where Methodism moved from being this kind of idea 
to being a movement and a church and a force that changed the world. From the very beginning, Methodism has been about taking that spark of salvation and turning it into a banked fire of faith that can endure good times and hard times. And that's been the work of the Methodist. That may be more than you wanted to know about that subject. But my point back there somewhere was that Methodists have always understood this story of the sower because helping people put down roots, even in rocky ground, and helping people avoid the weeds and the thorns and the distractions of this world have always been a big part of who we were ever since the beginning. And for a good part of my preaching career, that was the direction my sermons took when I, when I preached this particular parable. I emphasized how to put down roots. I emphasized how do you avoid the distractions that keep you from growing in your faith. Now later in my preaching, I tended to emphasize the final image here in Jesus' parable. Just in case I've gone on too long and you've forgotten, Jesus' explanation of the last part of the parable goes like this. I'm reading again from later in Matthew. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. That thirty, sixty, a hundredfold is where some of my later sermons on the parable went. You remember my baseball version of the parable where one batter strikes out without even swinging. And that would have been the first part of the parable. And then the next batter hits the ball very hard and high, but straight up. And it doesn't go anywhere. And it's just a long, loud out. In my telling of it, the third batter gets up and hits the ball long and hard, but they're, they're so caught up in the cheers and just knowing that it's going to go out that they kind of go into their home run trot a little bit too early. And then the ball hits off the top of the wall. The right fielder picks it up, throws it into second base, and throws out the batter who doesn't even know what's going on. The distractions. But the fourth batter hits the ball long and hard and true. And it's not just a home run. It's a grand slam. It's not just a grand slam. It is a walk-off, game-winning grand slam. My emphasis in these later sermons was on the success. A reminder to preachers and other Christians that even when you're working so hard and doing well, you're not going to succeed all of the time. There will be failures. There will be times when you strike out. There will be times when the seed just gets eaten by the birds. There will be times when you're thinking you're making progress, but someone just gets so caught up in the distractions. In those cases, the message of the fourth parable is that you are, maybe you are going to bat 250. But it's okay, because the one out of four success is not simply one victory. But it is a win that is multiplied 30, 60, 100 times more. And that's an encouragement that we need to hear sometimes, especially when we're trying to do good in this world that's not always cooperating with us. But as I was reading this story a few minutes ago, the middle stuff, in the middle of all this stuff that's going on in the world, I kind of came back in my mind to the first three points and how they work together with the fourth. I do think this parable is supposed to remind people of the pitfalls and the traps that are out there. And also to remind the disciples that even when the, when the victories seem few and far between, each victory is of such a scale that it overwhelms many defeats. But right now, this passage comes to me as one of those parables of which there are several of the scripture, that also reminds us that sometimes we have to be patient. And that's a message we need to hear right now. Right now when, even today, things are not working out the way we planned. We're getting ready for school to come back. We don't know what's going to happen. We're getting ready for our church to reopen. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We look at our own lives, our own businesses, our own work, our own ministries, and we're not sure what's going to happen next. This parable reminds us that, you know, everything we try, it's not always going to work. And that sometimes we're going to be time, there'll be times when we're going to feel frustrated. That we're going to feel hemmed in, that we're going to feel locked down. That we feel like we're not accomplishing what we want to accomplish. 
I think this parable is supposed to remind us that even in those times, in any time, in these times, like the sower, we keep on sowing. We keep on trying. We keep on doing good. We keep on working. And even if right now, or if it's seen to be sitting out there like you're waiting for the birds to come eat it off the pavement, or we're getting choked out by the weeds and thorns, there will be another time when what we do will bear fruit and the good result will be so many more times what we expect. Because God is patient and God rewards patience and persistence and he rewards them with abundance. So we, we keep on keeping on. That's what this parable makes me think about right now. It has been good to be here with you today and share this even, even by TV. And I'm so happy to have our TV ministry and so proud of our, all of our tech crew, everyone who works together to keep these services happening, even as we are not able to be together like we would like to be. But I am happy to bring this message and share it with you today. And I look forward to a day very soon when we will hug and we will shake hands and we will be together in the sanctuary. Let's close with a benediction. May you go now in peace, knowing that the love of God your Father, grace through Jesus Christ his Son, and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit are with you as you go, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.